Well, good day, traders, and happy Friday. And obviously, we're looking ahead at the week that will be. I think it's going to be an absolutely pivotal week, uh, whether you're looking at UK politics or whether you're looking at geopolitical issues, namely uh, the Trump-Xi relationship. We're going to, we're going to cover off on, on, on what exactly that means, how markets are positioned for that uh, in this video. But let's go straight to the boards. Let's have a look at the performance of uh, major currencies this week. You can see it's the Kiwi dollar, which has been on fire. I don't think that's going to surprise anyone. The daily chart has been uh, a breathtaking one. It's been just this one-way traffic. Um, yeah, I think the combination um, of the government targeting uh, fiscal spending of 15 to 25% of GDP up from 20%. Yeah, the market likes to hear fiscal spending when you've got a central bank who previously surprised everyone by keeping rates uh, on hold. I mean, that was a powerful statement in itself. We've seen their bank capital review as well. And I think, yeah, the Kiwi dollar has, has been a net beneficiary of all of that situation. Plus, we've got a little bit of momentum funds in there as well. So you can see up against the US dollar at 1.9% on the week. The British pound, we'll cover off on that in a moment. But yeah, Brit uh, the, you know, the quid's done very, very well this week up 1.8%. It's been one-way traffic, but I'm a little bit concerned about the pound at the moment. Um, we'll talk about that one in a second. Uh, the Swiss franc, yeah, I think that's been a function that we have seen for parts of this week. Uh, better volatility in markets, certainly in equity markets, uh, for FX volatility to really kick up. And again, we'll talk about vols in a minute. Um, we do need to see a sustained pickup um, in, in equity volatility. We need to see that VIX up into 18, 22% range. That's not happening at the moment, but that could this week coming forward. But certainly the Swiss franc uh, overpowering the Japanese yen as your so-called safe haven currency to choice. Um, the real and, and the Aussie dollar doing quite well as well. On the bottom, you've seen that South Korean uh, one uh, down about 80 base, 75 basis points or so. So you can get the picture there. The dollar in itself um, has fallen for five days in a row. It's had a, a pretty poor week, actually. The dollar index down 0.9 of a percent. We're through that 200-day, the moving average, for the first time in quite some time. We're looking down at the, uh, the, the, the 1st of November pivot lows. You get a break through that in the coming week. I think that sort of increased that dollar selling playing through. And I think also we've got to keep our eyes on firmly on the equity market. Um, you know, you have, if you look at the, the weekly chart here on the dollar in, uh, on the S&P, uh, we managed to hold that 2018 trend. We, we were looking like we were going to print a bearish outside week for the first time in a while. Not sure see how that, that plays out with tonight's uh, non-farm payrolls number. Uh, though I'm, as I say, recording this before the non-farm payrolls number, so that's something that we do need to consider there. And I think the market will not like, given what we saw from the, the ISM manufacturing numbers or a weak payrolls number there uh, as well. And certainly the ADP numbers suggest that that will probably be the case. Now, as we go through the week, let's have a look at what we're expecting. Um, we've got to look at the two high-level vote votes before we go into sort of the smaller level detail. Um, but before we do, I think just, just get, get an idea about how markets are positioned in terms of rates market. Before we go into those, those event risks, let's have a look at what rate expectations are doing at the moment. You can see here from the chart, um, we've got the different, uh, some, I've got uh, seven different central banks here. And you can see that third from right chart. Uh, just the expected move that's priced into the, the swaps or rates market for that, that, that meeting. Uh, the one that really springs out there is the RBA, you know, 66.1% chance that on the February 4th, which is the next meeting, we get a rate cut. I definitely think that's something to, to, to be interested in because if we get the cash rate then going down to 50 basis points, the RBA have made it pretty clear that if we go down to the floor at 25, then the conversation about QE becomes quite real. And that's something that we do need to consider as we go into 2020. Uh, on the event risk for Australia next Next week, there's not a lot. We've got NAB business confidence and Westpac consumer confidence numbers. We will be looking at trade much more closely in that capacity. You go out to the, the fourth column and you can see what's priced in across the curve, uh, the swaps curve over 12 months. You can see there's 37 basis points of cuts being priced in. Uh, and then you can see across the curves there, you know, you go to say like the Fed, for example, they've got 27 uh, of basis points being cut, but also one rate cut being priced in over the coming 12 months. We've come to a much more neutral setting. Those barriers for rate cuts uh, are very high now, and we do want to see a deterioration in inflation expectations and broad economics for those rate cuts to come through. Um, so certainly that's how we're positioned in terms of rates. So we talk about what's, what, what the consensus is. The two overriding factors for me clearly is the UK elections. Uh, they come through, obviously, we should see the polls closing at 10 o'clock local time on the 12th. So that's what, 9 o'clock on uh, AM uh, Eastern Daylight Time for us here in Australia and, and across Asia on the 13th. So it's going to be an Asian specific event again. Um, so those polls will close at uh, 9 o'clock early Asia time on the 13th late. Um, on, on, on the, the 12th for, for those people out in Europe and the UK. And then we'll get the exit poll shortly after than that situation. So I think, you know, there's going to be quite an active time. Uh, at the moment, I'd probably say, given what we've seen in these moves in the pounds, you know, this broad appreciation in the pound, sterling Aussie looking good, sterling yen, euro sterling going under pressure there. 
uh, and cable obviously trading up into 131 or so has been the idea that we're going to get a majority, not just a majority, but perhaps even a super majority. They need 320 seats to, to get a majority, the Tory party that is. Uh, anything above 345 I think would be considered a pretty good positive event and, and therefore probably keep the momentum in, in the pound going. The idea that they'll be able to extend the transition period mid next year, uh, something Boris Johnson has said that he probably wouldn't do anyway, but that's what they'll probably need to do. The complexities of that transition period is so high that that's something that they'll need to do. But so, you know, I think the market would probably be a little bit pound negative if we saw a situation where the Tories got a majority, but it was very, very slim indeed. And I think given what we priced in, you may see a little buy the rumour, sell the fat playing through. Of course, if we do see a hung parliament, that changes the dynamic quite significantly, in my opinion, and you're going to see the pound down quite sharply in that capacity. So as we go into that late session on the 12th in UK time, early morning for us here in Asia on the 13th, um, you know, we are watching those exit polls. We are watching those, um, those, those marginal seats, those swing states uh, or swing counties and, and, and towns, just to get an idea if, if Boris Johnson is going to get a majority of, of, of over 25 seats. If we get that, the sterling will rally and continue on its merry march. I think yeah, there are signs that the pound could do quite well in 2020. So we'll see how that goes. The other one, of course, on a top, top basis is how we trade as we go through the end of next week. Uh, into what is obviously the, the big event risk, and that's uh, you know the, the, whether we get a phase one agreement. My view is that, that, that when we're talking about this, you, you focus solely on tariffs. Will tariffs go up or go in or kick in? There's 15% tariffs on 160 billion worth of Chinese exports um, on the 15th. That's the Sunday. Uh, if they do go in, um, which is somewhat unlikely given the rhetoric we've heard last couple of days, um, we'll see a pretty dark open on the Monday, the 16th. Um, and that's something that we do need to consider about. So people may look to massage those positions, look to come to a more neutral setting in things like the yen, in things like US Treasuries, yeah, S&P as we go into the back end of the week. But again, as you know, if we do see an agreement to, to extend um, uh, the current status quo, look for the, another resume of talks into say like the new year uh, Chinese New Year on the 25th of January that's something that we're looking at for there as well but my best guess is that we probably won't we'll see an agreement to rediscover and revisit talks in, in, in the new year um, but we probably won't I think it'd be very unlikely we see a rollback of tariffs if we do see a rollback of tariffs in ones that are previously enacted the, the ones that are supposed to go in um, that would be very risk positive indeed and we'll see that Monday open strongly of course if tariffs do go in then we'll see a, a, you know a, a pretty dark open that's something that we are watching so price behavior as we go through the back end of the week. Elsewhere, apart from those two major events which are really dominating everything that we've going on, I've talked about what's happening in Australia. In China, we've got um, you know, credit numbers that come out. Uh, they may be somewhat influential, but I don't expect to see massive moves in markets. Again, it's all about trade. Uh, Chinese CPI numbers as well. Again, not expecting that to be a much of a market mover. Uh, in the US, we get CPI numbers at the beginning of the week, or sorry, Thursday. Uh, the market's looking for, what, 2% on the headline, 2.3% core. Uh, we've got the Fed meeting coming out shortly afterwards. Um, we're not expecting that to necessarily be a game changer. Uh, the Fed, there's well, very little as we showed from that the, the previous chart about what's happening in rates. The market's not expecting a move here at all. You know, I think it's business as usual. They're not going to take too much of a, a gambit ahead of what, we, you know, obviously is the situation where, where trade will continue to be the case. If we were to see a situation where tariffs come in, I think the, the, the market would ramp up our expectations of, of, uh, of rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. We go away from being an insurance cut to something a bit more punchy. Uh, so that's definitely something that you'll be keeping an eye on. Retail sales on Friday as well, definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, but again, it you know, dominated what's happening in tariffs. Uh, ECB meeting midweek uh, throughout the week as well, something to keep an eye on there, but we're not expecting that necessarily to become fireworks. How does this all blend in? Well, let's actually have a look at what this means. Have a look at this table here. Uh, this is the implied volatility and realized volatility chart. You know, a lot of you guys will be out there using average true range, Bollinger Bands, just to get a sense of that statistical uh, volatility. But I like to use the implied volatility. We talk about all these event risks. What's this mean? What's the market saying? Do we expect big moves? Focus on that middle column, the one week at the money implied volatility. This is in that standard, uh, one standard deviation annualized number that we see. Um, so Sterling Aussie, the biggest volatility in terms of 11.35%. Sounds impressive. Where does that sit in the 12-month range? It sits 49th percentile. So it's not overly elevated. Even though this one-week implied volatility covers the election date, the market's saying they're not expecting big fireworks. If you look on the next column, you can see that that expected range with a 68.2% uh, level of confidence is 261 points up or down that range, therefore, in Aussie, of Sterling Aussie, if I use that as an example, 195.26, 194. Zero, uh, 190.04. Have a look at cable vols. 9.06 implied volatility one week. 
27th percentile. So markets are saying they're pretty comfortable with the idea that Johnson's going to get a majority, whether that's a super majority or whether it's going to be just a simple majority, we're okay with that. What they're obviously not pricing in from that situation is a hung parliament. If we thought a hung parliament was going to be higher, yeah, we'd be expecting those vols to be closer towards 70 percentile. That's not the case. Euro sterling, but you can see across the board on G10 here that sterling still has that highest implied volatility. That won't surprise given we've got a political event, which is a binary event in some capacity. Go down towards the dollar, what we expect expecting for the week a, a 53 point move up and down 68.85 down to 67.79 CAD vols still exceptionally low there most of them are still down towards those sort of 20 percentile so the market's still not expecting volatility in these markets to pick up even though we have these two massive events playing through go down to the bottom we can see implied volatility in the VIX or the, the implied volatility in the S&P over the coming 30 days 13th percentile still pretty low that had a bit of a move up into sort of 15 percent or so but it's come back a little bit oh oil and gold volatilities are still pretty low so the market is looking at these big event risks and saying you yeah, know probably on whole we're, we're expecting a fairly friendly outcome here is that right is that wrong obviously we'll have to see then go to the last one we've got risk reversals let's look at the the skew of call volatility relative to put volatility as you can see here in Aussie dollar that sits at a negative number there negative spot 8 uh, 28 75 so what we're looking at is a situation where the uh, the, the implied volatility in, in puts is higher than that of implied volatility in calls which says you know shows but at the same time it's at 85th percentile so you know people have been um, pairing back those bearish bets for some time. Gold's a really interesting one because the, the correlation with real rates is still very high. The correlation with that pool of negative debt yielding debt across the world has separated quite sharply. But if we have a look at the um, the, 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 the skew here or the, the risk reversals, 1.36 uh, is basically a situation where the market has started to become a little bit more comfortable with holding gold and, and betting on uh, and gold upside, but it's still not at various stretch levels. I've been talking about the idea that gold is at much more neutral uh, settings, uh, and I think that's one to watch. Uh, we're on the right-hand side, you can see here positioning here, commitment of traders, and, and that's something that will get updated tonight there as well. So as we go through the new week, we can see that those volatilities are pretty low. The market's not expecting fireworks. The question we've got to ask, is that right or is that wrong? They're expecting a Tory majority. They're positioned for such. Does a hung parliament change that? If it does, obviously, I think vols go up and buying volatility is a very, very good trade in that capacity. My best guess is we do see a majority from, from uh, Boris Johnson. I think the market's well positioned for that. The other one, of course, is what happens with tariffs. If tariffs do go in next week, expect a very, very dark open on the 16th, which is not the one thing the market is expecting at this stage. They're expecting those talks to be pushed out and those tariffs not to be enacted at that stage. But it's all tariffs, it's all UK election at this stage.